Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins proudly presents the Origin Science Scholars Program. The Institute advances the scientific understanding and application of origins and evolution of human and natural systems. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented with the assistance of Case Western Reserve University's Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. Tonight, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Isaiah Nengo, who is Director of Science and Research at Turkana Basin Institute, Kenya, and Research Professor of Paleoanthropology at Stony Brook University. Dr. Nengo, Dr. Nengo earned his Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Nairobi and his PhD from Harvard. He studied there with top paleoanthropologist David Plibim and became protege of Stephen Jay Gould. Tonight, he will talk, be talking to us about finding Alessi, the story of a new infant ancestor. Please welcome Dr. Nengo. When I was young, growing up in Kenya, I was brought up on, uh, on a constant uh, story of origins that was based on, uh, on the Bible. And I just couldn't hear enough of it. I mean, it was fascinating at many twists and turns. And it wasn't until about, I was about 17 years old when uh, we went on a, on a visit to the National Museums of Kenya. And uh, I got to hear a lecture uh, by the, first, the very first white guy that I, have had, uh, I, I ever met, and that was Richard Leakey. And he uh, talked to us about plate tectonics. And the, uh, the theory of plate tectonics was just uh, was brand new. And, uh, you know, so I was, um, I was blown away, I was surprised, um, I was excited to learn that the world that we lived in was not the solid mass that I had always thought it was, but rather that it was uh, this, like an eggshell with all these uh, big cracks on it. And uh, you know, most of the big cracks, most of these big trenches are in the, in the oceans. But there are a few of them that are, on, uh, uh, that are continental. And we call them uh, rift valleys. Now there are about five of them. The biggest one is the Great Rift Valley. And it's uh, about a 400 mile uh, uh, trench that runs from uh, way south from Tanzania uh, at a place called Laitoli. It splits up into a second arm that heads out west, but we're gonna stay on this eastern arm and cast across Kenya through Ethiopia and disappears into, into Yemen. Now, um, little did I know at that time that uh, this trench was going to consume a good chunk of my, my interest, a good chunk of my life. Um, I since came to learn that um, up and down along this trench in East Africa are a series of sites that document a different story from, of origins that was very different from the one that I had grown up with as, um, as a child. And that's the story of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of evolution. Now if you come to think of it for a minute, that um, in a few thousand years, most of what we produce is gonna be gone. In a few million years, there'll be very, very little left. In a couple million, three million years, <laughs> there's almost going to be nothing that is left. The only empirical evidence of what life looks like, of what life looks like today, the only physical empirical evidence that uh, we can go by is what is going to be buried in the ground. Now, that's it. That's all. The fossil record is all you've got to go by. So anyways, so on this um, valley that runs uh, with sites like uh, Laitoli, uh, Alia Bay in Kenya, Kubifora, Hada in Ethiopia, and uh, Middle Awash, we've been introduced to some of this um, great finds that help us to understand where we, where we came from. In the central part of the valley is a depression, and there are so many lakes that, um, so many lakes that go up and down, but there's one particular lake in the central part of the valley, a, a lake that is known as Turkana. 
and um, on the, both on the eastern and the southern shores, or eastern and western shores of uh, Lake Turkana, are a series of, uh, of, of sites that give us a unique glimpse, a very long unique glimpse into, where, uh, uh, into the history of how we came to be. Now, the sites are so important, there's so many and so important, that about 10 years ago, about 11 years ago, uh, Richard Leakey decided to um, raise funds and put together a, an institute that has been named the Turkana Basin Institute with the purpose of making it possible for researchers to go out there and conduct research looking for fossils and, and, uh, and tools around the year. So we have two field stations on either side of the lake. There's one up near the border with Ethiopia on the eastern side of the lake that is known as uh, a place called Ilaret. And then we have another one on the uh, western side of the lake at a place called Takwell. So um, about 50 years now worth of research has now made it possible for us to, and here is what the fill, one of our fill station looks like. So in these places, researchers can come in, all their gear would be ready. I mean, you can send an email and say, look, I want to go out of the field for five weeks. I need X, I need Y, I need Land Rovers, I need assistance. And you come in and you get your staff ready and you can go out any time uh, anytime of the year. Anyway, so there's been about 50 years of research that uh, Richard Leakey and Meve Leakey and Louis Leakey have led in the Turkana Basin. And what that research tells us is that the Africa that we're familiar with today is not the Africa that has been. I mean, this is a very, very different Africa. If you, the farther we go back, it looks totally, totally different. So today, when you tell somebody or somebody tells you they're going to Africa, one of the things that we like to do is to go on safaris. And uh, what do you go do? You go look at animals. You go look at, um, you know, at elephants. You go and look at giraffes and lions and, and leopards and antelopes. But the thing is that if you go back just a little bit back in time, this is not the real Africa. Okay? The Africa of the past is completely different. And so the record of how Africa has come to be today, the only place you can get that record is in the fossil record. And the Turkana Basin is unsurpassed in allowing us to get a glimpse into how that Africa came to be. And that's what we want to do. We want to get to how we got here. Now, so um, why is the Turkana Basin so special? Well, there are sites in South Africa, there are sites in uh, Ethiopia, there are sites in uh, Tanzania that all give us different uh, windows into uh, different uh, uh, time periods. But what makes the Turkana Basin unique is that we've had a very long, very long period of, of fossil uh, accumulation we have probably the longest record of fossil accumulation. In the Turkana Basin, what we've discovered is that because of tectonics, because of uh, tectonic activities, you've had a history that geologists have come to call uh, what, what um, there's, a, there's a term they've coined, um, it's a made up of two words, deposition, and episode, depositional episodes. So there have been a long series of depositional ep episodes that go back all the way to the time of the dinosaurs. So in the Turkana Basin, I think it's the only place in the world where we can track our history going from today all the way back to when dinosaurs existed. And why is that so? Because there's been a series of faultings. So the, there's, a, there's a faulting, there's a basin, and then the, the sediment accumulations, the basin fills up, then there's faulting again, you know, so then there's another, another basin, so it fills up again, then there's another, another faulting, so there have been four different episodes of faulting. The first one it was during the Cretaceous into the Oligocene, that is roughly about 65 million years ago, up to about roughly about 
30 million years ago. The second episode uh, took place, the second episode of faulting took place at uh, the time period we call the Miocene, which goes roughly from around 20 million years ago to about 5 million years ago. And then the third uh, episode of faulting, the third episode, took place in a period we call the Pliocene to the Pleistocene. That is roughly about 5 million years ago until about, uh, I would say, about 1, 17, you know, uh, 17,000 years ago or so. And then the last one is in the Holocene, which is roughly about 10,000 years ago. Now, so um, the time period I'm going to be focusing on is a time period called the Miocene. In the Miocene in the Turkana Basin, we have a series of sites that are over a period we call the early Miocene, then there's the middle Miocene, and then there's the late Miocene. When we look at the fossil record in the Turkana Basin, what we see is in the Oligocene, you have animals like you won't even, you can't see them in a zoo. There's nothing like the African mammals we are accustomed to today. There are hyrosex elephants, anthracodias, creodonts, anthropoid primates. Perhaps the one mammal that has always been around in Africa is the elephants. In the middle Miocene, you see the arrival of, uh, or rather in the early Miocene, this, you see the arrival of rhinos, giraffes, and pigs, and some carnivores from Eurasia. I'm having some trouble with the connection. Oops. In the middle Miocene, you see, you see the arrival of bovids, that is the, 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 the big grazers that we're accustomed to, like the wildebeest. And then lastly, you see the arrival of the hipparion horses in the late Miocene. Okay, so the Miocene is a very important period in, uh, in, uh, in which Africa transforms from the way it used to be to the way we know it now. <clears throat> so the Tukana Basin has got some exceptional uh, fossils, and I want to mention just a few of them. We have fossils that uh, record uh, the fast and diversification of pastoralist traditions in uh, at a sites called Jaragoli and Lothagam. These are about 4,000 years. Uh, we have the origins of organized warfare, the first evidence of organized warfare at a place called Nataruk at about 100,000 years ago. We have the origins of the use of fire, the earliest evidence of the use of fire at Karari. We have the origins of the far significant expansion of the brain at Kubifora. We also have the earliest and most complete uh, fossil of an uh, Homo erectus at Nariacotomy, that's a Tucana boy. We have the origins of the making of stone tools at Lomaqui. We have origins of bipedalism at Alia Bay. And lastly, we have the origins of the ancestor that we share with all the apes at a place called Napodet, which is what I want to talk about today. So at Napodet, you had a huge volcanic eruption about 13 million years ago that led to the accumulation of about 60 meters of ash. And here's a geological section that gives you some sense of um, what, what uh, the accumulation was like. And the fossil that I want to talk about a lesson today is around the middle section of that ash sediments. This is what it looks like at Napoli today. And we have a forest. Often you have to take, go through a lot to reconstruct the environment. In this case, we have plotted about 100 uh, trunks of what's left of our trunks, of tree trunks, still standing as they were buried. Here's the team that discovered the lessee. This is the day we discovered the lessee, a long day where we um, didn't find much. And this is what Alessi looked like on the ground. Here's the day we excavated. This is the actual excavation of Alessi. That's Alessi being lifted and being transferred into a sandbox. Alessi being cleaned. Alessi much more clean, right? And it's spectacular preservation, the most complete skull of an ape ever discovered. To give you some sense about just how special this is, compare that to this guy's and this guy's 
and this guy's and this guy's. Oh, that's a lesson. <laughs> so. Could you give me approximate date for the site where you said uh, <clears throat> use of fire was um, you know, established? There's a debate, but it's about uh, a million years. What was the date when the first stone tools were discovered or created? Stone tools from Lomiqui are approximately about three and a half million years. And that's uh, about, uh, about a whole million years older than the previous evidence, which I think are the stone tools from Ghana in Ethiopia, which are roughly about two and a half million years. In the schools in Kenya today, are students taught about their major role of their country in the development of um, man? Or are they still hearing the religious story? Short answer. They are not taught much. So they're hearing a lot more of the religious story than they're hearing of the real evidence. But we'd like to change that. Being raised to understand and accept the Bible and then see evolution firsthand, does that make someone such as yourself or other scientists believe more in God, or does it challenge your beliefs in God now that you see evolution? I've read The Origin of Species uh, a few times. And um, one of the best readings of The Origin of Species was the one I did with Stephen Jay Gould, my, my mentor. And uh, perhaps for me, the most poignant uh, line is towards the end of the book, where uh, Darwin, after almost 350 pages in summary, you know, almost lyrical, um, there's this sentence that talks about the, how this view, this grandeur in this view of life. There's a certain, you know, there's a grandeur in this view of life. And I think that, um, you know, the, the real story about how we came to be, the twists and the turns and the, and the events, and I mean, the, what we reconstruct, the volcanic eruptions and the cracks in the, in the tectonic activity, it, it really is, there's a real grandeur in that view of life. And I think as a 17-year-old, there's, there, there's real grandeur if a 17-year-old in the middle of Africa who's never heard of Darwin hears the story and it resonates. Now, in terms of, um, uh, of religion, my parents are practicing Christians. It is something that it means a lot to them. And uh, I have, uh, I, I, I really think that the concept of uh, Dharma that Stephen Jay Gould came up with, actually he didn't come up with it, he just wrote about it, that um, Norma, that non-overlapping magisteria, that there are areas of, of human experience, that uh, there are multiple big areas of human experience, and that um, spiritualism and religion deals with one area of human experience, and uh, science and evolution deals with another. They don't, you know, they don't deal with the same things. I have deep respect for people who practice religion, including my parents. Uh, and, and my hope is that uh, when it comes to issues, empirical problems, empirical issues, that uh, those people who practice religion will also have deep respect for uh, people who, uh, uh, who believe in the sciences. So um, personally, I'm agnostic when it comes to religion. Thank you for joining us. You have been watching Dr. Isaiah Nengo discussing East Africa's Turkana Basin, centered on Kenya's and Ethiopia's Lake Turkana and its extraordinary wealth of fossils. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu. In the next part of the talk, Dr. Nengo will discuss Alessi, the remarkable 13 million year old skull of an infant ape found by his team in the Turkana Basin. Now, back to the talk. When we found Alessi, I mean, it was just like, wow. I mean, never expected something like this. I mean, you are, you are 200 years of paleontology, and this is the first time. I got to tell you that it's, when you're going back deeper into time and you're looking at this Miocene stuff, Miocene fossils, we're in forests. 
and things don't preserve well in forests. They, 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 they disintegrate. So, I mean, we get a lot of hominids. We get a lot more hominids, a lot of them. We get a lot more hominids, but when you get back into the Miocene, you find very, very little. You know, so finding this was like incredible. Now, problem is that when we turn it around, there were no teeth, right? And teeth are important for diagnosing fossils. And we all wanted to cry. It's like, Okay, it's a beautiful specimen, but it's just beautiful. There's nothing we can do with it. And then when we look at the front, we see that there's, we know from the sutures that it's a baby, uh, it's a, a, a juvenile, and the, the, the incise of the, of the front is just beginning to erupt. And so um, uh, we arranged for the fossils, for me to carry the Alessi to France. So Alessi took a trip to France and we went to Grenoble to the synchrotron. The synchrotron is just a huge machine where we have figured out how to speed up electrons and then inject them into a storage ring about the circumference of, um, the circumference of um, stadium. And then at strategic places, we have this powerful magnets that we use to bend the, uh, the, 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 the electrons and we emit photon beams, these X-ray beams that are millions of times more powerful, more bright than the standard X-rays that we have in the, uh, in the hospitals. So with this, we can visualize, we can penetrate through just about anything. And we've invented a technique that is known as tomography, where we can put the specimen on a platform, rotate it, and have uh, digitally slice it. Now, without harming it, we digitally slice it. And we can then put those slices together and reconstruct what is in the inside. We spent 10 days doing that. And so uh, here's what we found. All right, so you take the old techniques of paleontology and you, you uh, combine it with uh, the advanced physics, and what you get is amazing. So look at that thing. Everything is in, in focus. And in the inside, we have the brain endocast. The green things are the bony labyrinth, the semicircular canals, and uh, the cochlea on both sides. Not shown here are also the middle ear bones the malus, incus, and stepis. And we're talking about things that are about five, uh, five microns. A micron is about a hundredth, a thousandth of a, of a millimeter. And then at 0 0.7 microns, we can section through the teeth. And when we blow them up, there's enough detail that we can see cellular structures. And it turns out that uh, as kids, when we grow, we grow by an, uh, our teeth, so we have these enamel prisms, and we add one a day. So we can see those and we can count them. So it's a beautiful fossil inside and out. We can digitally print the teeth. The teeth are in the head, but we can print them and hold them in our hands. We can print the bony labyrinth and hold them in our hands. Here's a full set of teeth, both the left and right side, left and right side. And all of this was in our nature paper. Right, so every bit of fossil we find is important in building our story. But from time to time, there comes a spectacular fossil, uh, an exceptional fossil. I mean, Lucy, you know, uh, Alessi is one of those exceptional fossils. In one individual, we have so much we know. We can, we can bring back to life, or we can try to bring back to life 
as much as possible on a single individual. I mean, it doesn't happen but once every 100 years. All right, so those are the bony labyrinths. Now we could see the teeth, we could identify what species it was. And it has this unique characteristic in that the teeth from front to back, these are the upper molars, from back to back are longer than from side to side. Most species are the other way around. So most molars, this is, or, these are teeth oriented in the same way. Now, the only things that we know in the fossil record that has that front to back elongation are a, a very enigmatic group of or teeth that we'd known for a long time, but we had a very hard time figuring out exactly what to do with, to do with them. They belong to a group we call the Nyanza Petersens. So you've heard of the Australopithecines. I want to introduce you to the Nyanza Petersens. And um, with a lesser, we can now know a lot more and be able to figure out the relationship of Nyanza Petersens, which we could not do before. And what we know is that they actually were pretty successful and they go back all the way to the Oligocene of Tanzania about 25 million years ago and they lasted until about roughly about 7,000 years ago. And the last uh, representative of Nyanza Petersens is actually in Italy. It's a genus known as Oreopithecus. And Oreopithecus had given everybody a big headache for almost 100 years. So finally, we got Oreopithecus nailed. Here's a spatial distribution. Of course, I should have put Italy in there as well. <laughs> and when you look at skull, so at the top is a lessi. Here's a lessi. Um, uh, retro, where we try to correct for distortion in a very quick way. We're, we're going to do it properly later on. And then we have what are known as gibbons. We have orangutans, uh, chi uh, gorillas, chimpanzees, and uh, baboon. And overall, from the outside, the shape of the skull, it looks more like a gibbon. And in other aspects, in many aspects, it does look like a gibbon. So for example, it's got a very short face. And here's a graph that is uh, a plot of an index that we use to measure the, the, the length of the face. And here are gibbons. The gibbons are these small apes that are found in Southeast Asia. And uh, here's a lessee. This is uh, orangutan and gorillas and chimpanzees. So another, another way, if you look at the maxillary height, it also looks like a gibbon. If you look at um, the breadth of the, the bone between the two orbits, the interorbital breadth, um, Alessi again looks like a gibbon. But if you look at, um, there is a, a measurement we take from here to here, and then from here to there, in that measurement, Alessi does not look like a gibbon. Alessi looks more like a, uh, like a great ape. When we look at the brain volume, the Alessi has a brain volume that is more similar to that of a monkey. When we look at the circumference of the semicircular canal, the balancing organ that acts like a gyroscope in our brain, in our, in our head, Alessi does not look like a gibbon, it looks like a great ape. Like I said, we can um, estimate the age at death by looking at the enamel prison uh, additions. And we have been able to estimate that Alessi, Alessi lived up to 485 days. So Alessi was about a year and two months, plus or minus an era of maybe a couple of weeks. It's never been, this is the first time it's ever been done. We can, we can estimate the age of this individual quite precisely. Not only that, we can figure out the pattern of the development of the teeth. It's very, very unique 
in that the incisors, the upfront incisors, develop almost as fast as the fast molar. The fast permanent molar is always the fast permanent to, to erupt. Usually the fast incisor comes about a year to a year, two years later. But in Alessi, that fast incisor is, is going to pop out at about the same time as the M1. Very unique pattern. When we look amongst primates, the only place where we find this advanced I1 development is in gibbons and capuchins. We don't know what the significance of this is. So we, we need to do a lot more research. To, we need to do a lot more comparisons. But however, if you superimpose, there is a study by Wendy Dykes of a gibbon individual who, who lived until 2.88 years and when you superimpose Alessi's uh, develop, dental development pattern, it looks eerie like a gibbon. So in some ways it looks like a gibbon, in some ways it does not look like a gibbon. It's a chimera, it's in between, it's a missing link. Questions? You were able to look at brain, the brain, because I would imagine that soft tissue wouldn't have survived. That's actually a, a cast, a brain endocast. It's a, it's a, you know, there are sediments inside of it and they, they take the impression of the brain and then we just enhance it by adding the color. So we don't have the actual brain, we have the impression of the brain. Were you able to figure out um, whether Alessi would have a much greater brain size capacity than, say, a modern gibbon or another related ape? What we want to look at is not just the absolute size of the brain. We want to look at the relative size of the brain. So the absolute size of the brain for, let's say, our estimate right now is about 101 cubic centimeters. Um, a gibbon is um, roughly about 105 to 110. So it's, it's a little bit, uh, no, it's about, gibbons are about 101 as well. And um, monkeys, about the same. Now the difference is that the, the, a gibbon has got a much smaller body size. A gibbon is about six kilogram. Our body size estimate for Alessi is about 10 kilograms. So uh, there's, a, there's a, a plot I showed you earlier that showed that um, when you when you take relative, when you take brain size relative to body to brain volume relative to body size, unless it falls in more like with the monkeys. But what is interesting, and it's an early it's an early ape, so that's not surprising that the brain is not going to be as big as as uh, modern 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 apes. But the interesting thing is that there is a monkey specimen from Kenya um, at about the same age, and it's only got about one third the size of Alessi's brain. So if you compare Alessi to monkeys of the same time, then Alessi has a brain that is way much bigger, much more encephalization. I'm fascinated by the dental work. Uh, it seems that, uh, you know, that there are four cusps on the uh, rearmost teeth. And uh, are there any surviving species that have f four cusps on, on a molar, or is that something that's died out? The four cusps on a molar is something that you find in all apes. Yeah, all apes. Are, uh, monkeys are different. In, they have four cusps, but they have this crest that join the two back cusps and the two front cusps. So the four molars are known as, as lofts. But um, the four caps is, uh, is standard across anthropoids. Are Leshy's uh, facial deformities that you had to normalize because of time and age or because something happened to Alessi? Yeah, if um, post deposition, uh, uh, there's, there's uh, some deformation and there's a crash. Um, I think some of that deposition, so I think what, what we think what happened was that I mean, there was a volcanic eruption, and the, uh, Alessi and probably her mother just got buried. In, and then you had a rapid accumulation of, of sediments, 
and you know, the weight of the sediments probably distorted and crashed unless you scale a little bit. But um, we have the preeminent expert in correcting distortions and uh, we're at work right now. We're going to really thoroughly, it, it's, it's incredible work, we're going to correct those distortions. And in uh, about a year, a year and a half, we're going to introduce a lessee and distorted. And with, with flesh and uh, we'll make up some hair too. <laughs> we hope you've been enjoying the Origin Science Scholars Program with Dr. Isaiah Nengo. Dr. Nengo is the scientific director of the Turkana Basin Institute, Kenya, and a fellow of the Institute for the Science of Origins. In the second part of our talk, we learned about the way synchrotron imaging has been applied to the Alessi skull to reveal details such as the structure of its middle ear and the daily growth layers in its teeth. In our final segment, Dr. Nengo will talk about how Alessi fits into our evolutionary history as a common ancestor, or at least cousin, of humans, chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, and gibbons. Now, back to our talk. Why should we care about this tiny little baby ape that lived in Turkana and perished in a volcanic eruption 13 million years ago? What does it mean for us? What can we learn from, you know, what big things can we learn from Alessi? There's always a question that if you don't know where you are coming from, then you don't know what, where you're going. If you woke up this morning and you couldn't remember at all where you're coming from, you're, you're going to not have a clue about whether you should go here or go there. There's that movie called Memento where this the guy wakes up every morning and he's forgotten. He's, he's got no long time memory. You know, I think that's true for evolutionary history as well. And that's why we learn. That's why we learn the past. So we can figure out how we come, how we come to be and where we need to be going. You're right. And um, so we've always had a debate about we, where are we going to find these ancestors? Where are the rocks that are going to tell us about where we came from? And never bet against Darwin. Darwin always said you've got to go to Africa because that's where many of the ape species, living ape species are found. Of course, everybody bet against Darwin. They went looking in Asia, they went looking in Europe. Nobody was bothering to look in Africa. And I think the re reason why the leakies are so famous and so important deserve to be, because if you come to think back, you know, when Darwin is proposing this idea, there's not a single fossil. We, uh, I mean, what a problem. I mean, should we start looking in Asia, Europe? Where the hell do you start looking? It was a difficult problem. So everybody's running around in, uh, in Europe and Asia, and there's this abstract called Louis Leakey. Everybody thought he was crazy. He said, I'm going to go look in Africa. I think that's where, where, that's where they were. And uh, took Louis and, and Mary almost 30 years of doubt and persistent searches until they found something at Olduvai. But one thing people don't realize is that Lewis and Mary did not just spend their time looking for things in our immediate lineage. They were also looking for ape ancestry because it's important that we know our ape ancestry as well. All right, so um, this is not a very good uh, clear, I mean, it's, you may not be seeing much, but um, what it shows you here is what I consider our tree. This is a primate tree. It shows how we're related, how we've figured out how modern things are related based on DNA study, for example. We know that um, of all the living things today, we are most closely related to chimpanzees. So chimpanzees and humans share a common ancestor, and then chimpanzee, human, and gorillas share the next common ancestor. Then chimpanzee, human being, gorillas, and orangutans share the most common ancestor. And then we add in the gibbons, the so-called lesser apes. And together, we can call ourselves the apes. Sounds like a name for a, a band. <laughs> right, so um, 
think of it as a, uh, you know, if you go up a tree or if you, you start from the terminal branches, they're smaller, they get bigger with more, with more branches. So the terminal branch that we belong to, the one that we share in, um, with, with chimpanzees, uh, if you haven't heard, we've given it a sexy scientific name, we call it hominini. We're going to label it, we're going to call it ancestor number four. And then the next one that we share with orangutans, we give it the name hominine, and we're going to call it number three because hominine is too hard. And then um, we have the one we share with the orangutans and everybody else, that's hominide, that's number two. And of course, our ape ancestor, the great, 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 great granddaddy, number one, hominoide. So the debate has always been, where should we find these ancestors? Because when we're looking for missing link, we're looking for missing links of various branches. We want to reconstruct the whole branch, all these branches, right? So we've done a fantastic job up until this point, filling in things just on this line. We have very little fossils for four, three, two, and one. There are very, very few fossils. Most of what we have found so far all go post four. So all the stuff from Pleistocene all go here. But when you come down here, it's tough. And so here, all these are post four. It's a nice bush. We still need a lot of work, but we're, we're doing a lot better. And then if you look over here, there is, you know, there is, we have that ape ancestry that we kind of want to forget. We don't want anybody to know that they are with us. It's Uncle Joe. We hide him in the closet. <laughs> uh, my job is to pull out Uncle Joe and say, look, Uncle Joe is part of your family. Right. So if you look in the fossil record of humans and apes, this is what the picture looks like, or this was what the picture used to look like. We've filled some of these gaps. Right? So what, but the general trend, the general pattern is that from about zero to about four million years, we find a lot of stuff in Africa and not much anywhere else. And then when we go to a period we call the early Miocene, that's roughly from about 20 to 14, we find a lot of things in Africa. And there's a big gap in Africa that runs from around 13 to about 5 million years ago. And it so happens that there's a lot of things in Eurasia in that time period. So it has led some people to claim that, you know, what this means is that maybe our ancestry started off in Africa, everybody left and went to Eurasia, and then they came back walking on two legs. And Seriously, people think that. So here are just some quotes. Tuttle in 2006 tells us that this has stimulated researchers to look to Europe for proximate Miocene ancestors of African apes and australopiths. So he's talking about number three branch. Here's one from Began in 2003. He says, Scientists have long assumed that the ancestors of modern African apes and humans evolved solely in Africa, but a growing body of evidence indicates that although Africa spawned the first apes, Eurasia was the birthplace of the great ape and human clade. He's talking about branch number two. And just to be clear, he hasn't changed his mind um, uh, by 2010, and I, can, I know he hasn't changed his mind. He says, oh yeah, not only that, I think we've identified the potential common ancestor number two, we call him Graphopithecus, lived between 6 and 16, 16.5 in Germany and Turkey. Here is a branching order that is supposed to show the relationship of living and living apes, living and extinct apes and other anthropoids. And the key thing here is, here is the monkeys. So it tells us that most of what we had considered to be apes in Africa are not even apes. Because according to this chart, according to Harrison 2010, 
They predate the split between monkeys and apes. There are only two that qualify as Kenya Pithecus and Samburu Pithecus. Everything else is much, much earlier. Okay, so uh, the idea that we have very long, deep roots in Africa is something that is contested. The idea that the direct lineage, our direct lineage is in Africa, that is not contested as much. So scientifically, the biggest question is still the same question that Darwin put forth. Where did our common ancestor with the apes live? We have spent a great deal of money trying to look for the immediate ancestors. We haven't put in as much effort in looking for those deeper ancestors. And we haven't put in a great deal of effort looking for those deeper ancestors in Africa. There's been very, very, very few people looking for those deep ancestors in Africa. And here is one from Alba et al, 2015. This was a paper published in Science, and they found something that they call pliobates. And they, as you can see from this uh, cladogram, from this tree, what they say is pliobates is potentially in the group that is the last common ancestor of all humans and apes. So it is probably the common ancestor, I mean, it's number one. Okay, so there's been stuff found in Europe and Asia that has been claimed to be ancestor one, two, three, and four. So Alessi is important because Alessi fills or begins to fill in the gap. One of the things that not only fills in the gap in time, but also in morphology. We have so much of Alessi, that's why Alessi is important. And in our analysis, in the nature paper, which you can't see very well, but so I'll just tell you that we find that Nyanza pithecins, in which Alessi belongs, is the sister group, or is likely the group from which the last common ancestor of, of humans and apes came from. Pliobates is way off. Pliobates is up here. It's very, very primitive, according to our analysis. To simplify it, Alessi is the common ancestor of, or Alessi belongs to a group that is a common ancestor of human and apes. I have a little video here. <laughs> That's a gibbon and a cat. <laughs> and Alessi would have been about the same age as this little guy over here. And what Alessi and other fossils from the Miocene that we're beginning to find in Africa tell us is that human and apes, human apes and even monkeys, those ancestors are all African, probably all African. Certainly one is now African. What it tells us is that Africa has been kind of an, an evolutionary laboratory of apes and monkeys a place where natural selection and other evolutionary processes experiment with different forms. Hominini, hominine, hominide, hominoide. So they evolve in Africa and then they spread out to Europe and Asia. And that's been going on for well over 20 million years. So we have very deep roots in Africa. We have deep roots, roots that go beyond 200,000 years, roots that go beyond a million, roots that go beyond 
10 million. Roots that go 20 million years. Africa is in our system in a, in a much more significant way than we think it is. And I think this is important because um, when I, I typed in dinosaur um, TV shows, I found that there were 73 dinosaur TV shows going all the way from 1980s to present. My kids, we have three kids, know all the dinosaurs. They can name this species, and they can name that species, and they can name that species. There's a, a poll that showed that the one thing Americans all love are dinosaurs. <laughs> Republicans, Democrats, <laughs> we all, the one thing we all love is what? Dinosaurs. I come to think of it. Our own ancestry, how we came to be, our own story, and the way Richard Leakey says, if there's one species we need to study thoroughly, it's humans. Because we are the ones that have the potential of really screwing things up. <laughs> so our own story, how many episodes do we have? How many different TV programs do we have? How many kids do we have that can name the different species of apes? Or, the, or, or you know, how many of them know what a Nyanza Peterson is? They know what Brontosaurus is. They don't know their own lineage. And so I say, the shortcoming in Kenya where we, our kids don't learn the true story is a global shortcoming. It's an American shortcoming. And I would like to see a time and a place where we know our own story as intimately as we know the dinosaur stories. Thank you. The Origin Science Scholars Lectures are presented by Case Western Reserve University's Institute for the Science of Origins, with the assistance of the Siegel Lifelong Learning Program, the College of Arts and Sciences, and Media Vision. For more information on the Origin Science Scholars Program, including a full video archive, please visit the Institute's website at origins.case.edu.